Welcome back to Hey All You Zombies. This is our weekly show in which we discuss all sorts of crazy things. Uh, and I want to make clear that Hey All You Zombies, that's not exclusive. If you are not a zombie, that's okay. You're welcome here. Uh, in fact, I checked with all the other zombies and said, is it okay if I bring somebody who's not a zombie? They're all, yeah, right. This zombie um, doesn't mind. That zombie does not mind. There you go. Zombie. My name is Chris Abel, and uh, my partner and co-host over there is Mr. Richard Krause. This is my pen zombie that I'm showing. It sits on my desk. That's awesome. Impaled with a pen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love this. I love the fact that you could almost do an entire show of what's on Richard's desk. It's, well, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, last year or the year before, uh, there's a website called Desk Space. And they came to me and said, we want to know where you write. Now, this isn't the same office that I was writing in back then. Uh, but I took pictures, uh, lots and lots of pictures, which uh, eventually ended up on their site. And people wrote in, and they're like, Jesus, how do you get anything done? There's just so much stuff. There's, you know, pens with my little punk rock eraser on it. Yeah. There's, uh, you know, I have lots of these. I have lots of... Uh, uh, swords. This is from Game of Thrones. It's a uh, it's a letter opener. Letter opener. And this, opener. this one's from Kill Bill. It's a samurai sword. I have lots of those things. Nice. And I I like to think um, that having things like this on my desk actually um, inspire me more uh, than you know just having a clear blank. This this thing uh, has overseen the writing of all my books. It sits up here and watches me while I type. And it, it, nine books later. He's witnessed it all. He's witnessed all the madness. All the madness. <laughs> but I've got I've got lots of things here. I've got uh, uh, a monkey that holds a pen. You know, that's a that's a crucial item. But there's just a lot of stuff. And if I go start to go blind, I can always uh, you know pick up the old thing. And I like it because oh, I like that. Yes, yeah. I like that. Um, I like it because um, it just you know sort of keeps your mind active. I think to have lots of you know interesting slash silly things at your fingertips all the time. Well, and I think it also helps um, stimulate you towards being original. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you try to be a creative person. Writing is hard. You go out there, you, you watch a you know, number of television shows, you're bombarded by all the ads. When you sit down, it's all you can think of. It's right. what you've been fed out there. So it's nice to have a uh, cacophony of different sort of unusual reminders, you know, monkeys and bears and stuff like that. The original, Richard. I, I, I find this very relaxing, and I, I, I took this from a, a hotel room in, in Los Angeles, and it's it, it says things like, pass the buck today, yes, and the thing is you spin it, and whatever it lands on is, but it's like an eight ball or some, one of those things, right? Except that I, I don't even really ever look at it. I just like watching it spin, and it will spin for like literally hours. It, it just, <laughs> and it goes and goes and goes. And so this has been, uh, this is one of my... Uh, uh, relaxation devices when it gets a little tense around here when the words aren't coming this thing starts spinning the more this spins the tenser I am but it mellows me out a little bit so there like we go a, a prayer a day, I'm gonna give it a spin yeah <laughs> um, I found a, there's a new video game that just came out mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, for iPad and iPhone and it's called the bowling dead yeah <laughs> Um, so this is a video game in which um, you you have to take out zombies by bowling a, rolling a bowling ball. Oh, and you, that's cool. you put your finger on the screen, you just flick it. So it's an actual alleyway. You've got zombies coming at you from the yeah. other end, and you can do things like uh, have the bowling ball ricochet off the walls. They give you bowling balls. There's one bowling ball that when you you hit it and you press the button, it causes all the zombies to dance. Yeah. Disco but do ball. you have to hit them in the head necessarily, or you can hit them anywhere? No, you can hit them anywhere. Although they do, uh, there is a move where you can actually flick the ball up into the air, and it will hit the zombies in the head. Because um, if you don't hit them in the head, you're not doing anything. You're not well, killing them. That's that's, the, that's all I'm saying. They did a little twist here in the, <laughs> in the story. They said what was interesting is that the zombie apocalypse happened, and of course you had the military and all the gun nuts coming out, and it turns out. They, they said Hollywood was wrong. Guns don't do anything to these zombies. <laughs> and, and here's the best part. They say that you know uh, most of the planet ended up sort of becoming victims. There's very few people left that are alive because gu guns just simply don't work. And it comes down to one mad scientist, and his name is Dr. Krauss. Oh. 
There you go, yes. Uh, they, I, I haven't played to the end of the game, so I don't know. They haven't shown what he looks like, but I don't need to. He's I imagine right he has slick back hair and glasses. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, totally. But he's the one who figured out that bowling balls apparently will work against the zombies. And so if you, you keep playing, you can unlock like chainsaw bowling balls and you know, explosive <laughs> bowling balls and all sorts of fun things. It actually, I mean, I like it because it's the emphasis is more on humor than it does on, on tension or fear. But a great fun game. But I, I just, it made me happy that uh, uh, their mad scientist is named Dr. Krauss. Well, us, uh, us Krausses like to think out of the box. That's the thing. Is it? it's, that's why we have our little spin devices and uh, um, whatnot everywhere. <laughs> just, well, that's very cool. I bet you they spelled it K-R-A-U-S-S, though. I don't, I, I don't know. It was, it was a spoken thing. It was a, I love that the hero is a bit of a rockabilly kind of guy, so there's a 1950s kind of vibe. So he probably, Dr. Krauss probably does have slick back hair. So this, does, this sounds like my kind of game. Yeah. I like, yeah. I like this. Well, that's very cool. So, uh, and how long will it take you to get to the end of the game? Is this one of those things you'll be playing uh, for the next millennium? No, no, no. It, it, it's a casual style of game. It looks like it might take me a couple of days to try to eventually get to it. Uh, it's free. It, what is it free or is it 99 cents? I think it's free, and then you have to pay for various upgrades and sort of right. things that are happening within the game. But definitely worth to check out. Uh, the Bowling Dead, I don't know if it's out on it. Well, it's not out on Android. Hopefully it will be coming. But if you've got an iPad and an iPhone, yeah, it's worth grabbing. Well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I'm no... I don't know how I feel about these games that, that are free or very cheap. And then it's like you, you, you go, oh, that sounds like fun. I'll give that a go. And it's like to actually play past a certain point, it's going to cost you $15. But I just I don't think I – I don't like it. It seems like a lost leader to me. It seems like a bit of a sucker to get you in and then just suck more money out of your pocket. Yeah, there are a couple of them that are out there. The idea is that um, you can play the game, but just very, very slowly. And so they're, they're sort of feeding on people's impatience. If you are someone that you can delay your, your uh, gratification and just keep playing, you can actually play games like The Simpsons and, and never pay a dime. But it takes a lot of self-discipline. And, of course, they know. Most people don't have that. It's like, all right, fine, I'll pay $5. Just let me get to the next phase. And it's easier. And, you know, on your iPhone, like on, on my thing, when I download songs, I don't load up my iTunes with money anymore. It just goes directly to my credit card. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I have no way of controlling myself. You know, it used to be, you know, when you get down to the last dollar or something like that, you have to go to the store and get another card. It was, you know, you'd think about what you did now. It's just, oh, whatever. Eight man by the kinks. Absolutely. I need that, you know. Uh, but, you know, you talk about patience and people having patience. And, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an older man. I'm an older man. I've been around a little bit. I've, I was, I was, I, I date back before the internet, before everyone was sort of, you know, uh, uh, instantly gratified by uh, YouTube videos and things. But I find myself lately, someone sent over a video that they said, you're going to want to see this. It's so funny. It's perfect for you. It's going to make your head will explode. It's so funny. But it was six minutes long. And I was like, I'm not going to, what do I do? I have things to do. I'm not going to sit here for six minutes and watch a video. That's insane. <laughs> and it took, it was here for, you know, four or five days sitting in my inbox. Uh, and I kept getting emails. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? You're going to love it. You're going to love it. I was like, it's six minutes long. I have no time for this. <laughs> and eventually I watched it and they were right. I watched it again. I spent 12 minutes watching it. It was so funny. And it's a, I'll see if I can find it. Man, I don't know if I saved it. It starts off, it is from a British television show that looks to be like a, a travel log. And I think this must be one segment of it. And they are in a pub that specializes in cider. That's what they sell at this pub. And, okay. you know, you're not a drinking man, uh, but cider is the devil's juice. Cider is just not, like, it's, it's, it's the stuff that turns people into hooligans. And so they, they talk to all these regulars who do nothing but sit there and swill cider like it's going, like it's going to be declared illegal the next day. And the thing that's funny, though, is that at first it starts with, you know, in the west part of London, there's this pub, and it's very true. And then eventually there's one guy who got so drunk on cider one night, he got hit by a train and it cut off one of his legs. And now he's got a prosthetic leg, then he drinks cider. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another guy that takes out his glass eye when he goes to the bathroom and puts it in his pint so that no one will drink from it. And it just turns into this completely surreal, bizarro land version of this travel. 
It's awesome. I will try. I'm going to make a note to try and find this. We have to post it on the oh, site. Yeah, please do. Zombies.com. And trust me, it's worth the six minutes. It's really good. Yeah, for us, pub culture is uh, such an alien thing. I mean, for so many generations over in the UK, this yes. is what people do. You know, at the end of the day, they go to the pub and they just hang out, and you have all these weird idiosyncrasies and quirks that come out of people. Yeah, well, and and I mean, these people have been drinking together, it looks to me, for, you know, I don't know, like forever. They're all older people. Um, and I think, you know, the, the younger pub goers now, because pubs are closing left and right in, in uh, the UK right now. And, you know, the last time I was there, on in my way on the plane there, I was like, oh, man, you know, I will, I will drink cask pulled London Pride and it's gonna be awesome and it's and then you go to the pubs and it's like would you like a Bud or a Bud Light? I'm like, oh please oh. don't tell me those are the only options for me. Please don't tell me. Um, and so I yeah I think it's the older, you know, set that are keeping this real sort of idea that the idea that we have of pub culture alive. But uh, <laughs> this video totally worth the six minutes and thirty eight seconds or something. I will find it. I shouldn't have given it away. <laughs> Because no, 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 that's it fine. You know? Makes me laugh right now. <laughs> that's yeah. You, last night you did a cool thing. What was that? Well, here's a photograph uh, from the cool thing I did last night. This was at the Tiff Bell Lightbox. That's me interviewing Judd Apatow and Leslie Mann on stage. They have a new movie coming out called This Is Forty. You can see the uh, poster in the background. But uh, we were up there for about an hour and a half. We had uh, almost 600 people show up. It was a little bit nutty over there. And uh, we talked about not just uh, the This Is Forty, although we got to that eventually. We showed clips from uh, Knocked Up and The Forty Year Old Virgin. We talked about uh, the way that they worked together. They were lovely. They were just a, a huge amount of fun to work with. And uh, the audience loved them. We talked about our mayor, Rob Ford, a little bit, who's no longer the mayor. If you're watching from outside of Toronto, we fired our mayor last night. Crazy. Uh, and uh, he'll be back, I'm sure of it. But for right now, uh, he's on probation or something. I don't know. It's, it's gotten more complicated today. Yesterday, they were like, oh, he's been kicked out of office. But now it's like he's going to be the mayor for another 14 days or something like that. Anyway. I tried to explain that to Judd Apatow on stage yesterday, and I'm not sure he really understood, and it made me realize, as I was explaining it to him, that I don't really understand it either. Anyway, we fired the mayor yesterday. We talked about that, um, but they were there, and they were game. We were up there for an hour and a half, uh, me grilling them, and then we took some questions from the audience and people asking them very sort of specific questions about the way they work together, all that kind of stuff. And it made me think of uh, other people doing press. Now, I'm someone who... Uh, uh, is part of that machinery. You know, I interview people, I interview actors and directors, uh, and then I write about them either in my column in Metro or uh, they, the, the, you know, the interviews air on Canada AM or, or whatever or on the web. Um, so this is something I'm very familiar with, which is why it would have gobsmacked me to be a part of uh, the Angus T. Jones thing that happened yesterday. Now, do you recognize the name Angus T. Jones? No, I don't. I'm afraid not. No. Angus T. Jones, I will tell you, makes $350,000 an episode for being the kid who apparently nobody knows <laughs> on Two and a Half Men. So, oh, okay. So I don't think he's the half a man. I think he's the other. He's like the friend or another brother or something. Uh, but he's he's the kid on the show. He makes three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars an episode, and this week he recorded a video testimonial for a Christian website in which he called the show filth, and then he said, "If you watch Two and a Half Men, please stop watching Two and a Half Men." Uh, and it goes on, please stop watching it, please stop filling your head with filth, you cannot be a true God-fearing person and being on a television show like that, I know I can't, I'm not okay with what the Bible says and being on that television show, uh, except that, you know, he's accepting the $350,000 a week to be on that show, and who knows, contractually, maybe he can't get out of the contract, even though he may desperately want to, because of whatever his beliefs are, um, maybe today he'll be fired, who knows, this video has gone viral, it's absolutely everywhere, but, uh, it, it, you know, only once in all the years that I've been doing this, all the years that I've been interviewing actors, um, I can count on one hand, no, one finger, all the uh, the amount of times that I've had someone go, I know the film's not very good. 
I know it's not very good. And it happened once, and I can't remember the name of the movie. I think it was called Punch. And uh, the director was in. It was a first-time director. He was a great guy. I kind of liked the movie. And during the course of the interview, this guy was like, well, you know, when I look at it now, there's a lot of stuff I would have done differently. Uh, I would have, you know, and it was just, and I, I, just, I sat back and I was like, somebody needs to uh, tell this guy yeah. that he's <laughs> promoting the movie. But he was just, like, the, the thing that made that interview remarkable is that he was honest. He was gotcha. totally honest. You know that not everybody that you sit down and talk to is really proud or thrilled about their, their work, you know. And uh, in everything, in every single project. Some people truly are. Um, but this guy wasn't. And it made the interview like quite remarkable. So I've been thinking a little bit about Angus T. Jones, an actor who I, uh, I don't say this proudly, but I've never seen Two and a Half Men. I'm not, I, I don't watch a lot of sitcoms except The New Girl, because Zoe Deschanel is cute. Uh, but other than that, I don't, I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. So I, I've, I've never seen the show. Uh, but... Um, I don't know exactly what kind of filth he means, but, you know, his faith clearly uh, is overriding his sense of judgment, certainly in terms of uh, the, the promoting the show in any kind of reasonable way. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it. I mean, I think that if he truly feels this way, um, he should be, he should quit. If he truly feels this way, instead of going public, uh, you know, he should, he, should, he should just lay it on the line with the producers and say, listen, I don't want to do this anymore. Now, maybe he has done that. Maybe he's not getting anywhere. Maybe so he felt the only recourse that he had was to get out there and kind of state his mind in a very public way and hopefully, you know, get fired or, or something to get him off the show that he clearly doesn't want to be on anymore. But I, I, I can't think of any other reason why he might want to behave this way. Yeah, that's, that's unusual. It just it got really dark. I know it looks like it's nighttime here, but it's actually only uh, 4.45, so very unusual. Let me just turn on some lights here. I know. It got dark. Uh, really quick. Uh, very yeah. fast. There we are. That's better. <laughs> yeah, it's unusual. I mean, the, the show has been such a, a big success. It's unlikely that he's going to find that kind of success. It's unlikely that, that anyone from that show yeah. will then move on to the kind of success that, that this show has, has enjoyed. I mean, you know, this is one of the biggest hits, uh, you know, not maybe ever, but, um, you know. Maybe not artistically, but financially, you know, financially, in terms of the numbers, yeah. yeah. Listen, this is television we're talking about. You know, we're not, they're not out to reinvent the wheel. They're, they're, they're out to make people happy and, and, you know, make people laugh. And, you know, the show, as I say, it's not my thing, but people love this show, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it certainly has gotten its, its fair share of publicity. So I'm just, I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what his uh, situation might have been. While we've been talking, uh, some photographs came in. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is... Uh, where are we here? That is Judd Apatow, Leslie Mann, Eugene Levy, and me. Uh, before we went on stage, Eugene is the chair of the Canadian Film Center's uh, Comedy Lab, and that's who I do these interviews, these on-stage interviews for. So he was kind enough to uh, introduce us, which was uh, uh, quite thrilling. And it's funny to see Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow and I and Leslie are standing backstage, and Eugene is out on stage, and he's he's introducing them. And uh, he's being very glowing. I mean, John Apatow is, 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 in many ways, the person who has kind of defined big screen humor in the last decade. Movies like 40 Year Old Virgin and uh, uh, Knocked Up and all that. There's, there's a, and, and all the stuff that he produces you know, on television, girls and movies and all that stuff. Super bad. And, um, and so Eugene started in, and Leslie goes, Oh, he's one of your heroes. You should be recording this to Judd. And Judd sticks his, his cell phone out, record on, and records Eugene Levy talking about him. Which I just thought was very cool. You've got one of the most successful, powerful guys in Hollywood. And uh, he was so thrilled that Eugene Levy, our Eugene Levy, was talking about him in that way because he told me later he grew up loving SCTV. And to have Eugene talking about him in this way was very thrilling for him. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and here's another shot of us on stage. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Talking it up, yucking it up. He was, uh, Judd was, uh, funny, you know, he, uh, he took a phone call from his daughter in between, but didn't tell her that he was on stage in front of 600 people. So he just held the, the phone up to, uh, his microphone and she's like, Hey dad, I just kind of, kind of a weird letter from my friend, Amy. Do you want to, <laughs> and I didn't hear people talking right away. So it was, it was a, a cool and funny moment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but anyway, back to Angus T. Jones. Uh, 
I'm not sure how I feel about this guy. I know that uh, Alec Guinness certainly never wanted to be a part of the Star Wars movies. He begged for the character to be killed off. Right. Uh, but he did so privately. And I'm not really sure about this public kind of, uh, I don't think you call it a meltdown, but there seems to be something about that show, just ask Charlie Sheen, that, t- <laughs> that, that pushes people towards kind of extreme behavior. Well, it, it's it's sad because, you know, um, you're talking about an actor who started off on that show being very young. He was just a little boy, uh, if that's the, the character I'm thinking of. Yeah. And so this is, unfortunately, it's sort of opening up the door that success has not been very kind to him in terms of developing as a human being and, and becoming an, an adult, that he's now, I don't know if there's any groups or cults that are available that are kind of involved in what's happening with him, but... Rather unfortunate. That yeah, I don't know. I mean, my my feeling is that, or my understanding of this, is that it's a Christian fundamentalist group that he's a part of, and yeah. so I, mean, I don't think that we're calling this this group a cult. I don't want to I don't want to paint it with that brush. But TMZ had an interesting thing on, and I'm just seeing if I can pull it up here. Um, you know, that bastion of great uh, <laughs> journalism. <laughs> yeah. Now. Uh, oh, it's interesting here. Now, see, there's been new developments. Okay. Um, but but what's happened here is that th- this church that he's a, a part of, or, or was claiming to be a part of, um, was... Uh, oh, where is it? I don't know. I might not be able to find it. Um, but... It, let me tell you... Yeah, no, I can't find it here. There, there was a story about uh, some of the other beliefs that um, these uh, that this church was uh, sort of preaching and and, and putting forth as uh, in some of these other videos. Because apparently, one of the things that one of the ways they communicate with their their audience is to is to, uh, um, to through these videos. And yeah. uh, um, let's just see here. Yeah. Yeah, he, he. Yeah, it's uh, Angus told Hudson. Christopher Hudson is the is the uh, conspiracy theorist theorist who interviewed Angus for the Forerunners Forerunner Chronicle web series, and um, uh, it says here that apparently Angus told Hudson that men was ungodly filth and somehow connected with Satan, and that he no longer wants to be on the show. And so I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it sounds like there's something more going on here, but I would, I think we're going to have to file this one under developing story. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, every, anyone can in this business have a, um, a conflict of ethics, a conflict of, of morality in terms yeah. of um, the, all the weird kind of things that happen in this business. But you're right. I think there are better ways to kind of handle it. Just fulfill your contract and get out. It, it can't be, it's not like he's contracted for the next 10 years. I'm sure yeah, it's only the, the guy time. will never have to work again. For the rest of his life, three hundred fifty thousand dollars an episode. If he's not uh, stupid with the money, he should. You know, he and his kids and whatever else will be set up for the rest of their lives. Take the money and run, and then become a preacher right. if that's what you want to do. Well, and just money. just to be clear, you didn't interview Angus. You haven't met Angus. It was no, just no. This is there is no. Listen, I have no connection to the story at all, except what I've read. And really, the only connection I was making here is last night. Um, I was part of a big cog in a large machine of, for promoting a, a film, and a lot of the uh, people in the audience last night were students, and so we we talk about filmmaking in a very different kind of way uh, in these things than we would if it was an interview for television or something like that. We actually talk about the real nitty gritty about getting movies made, gotcha. um, so it's not strictly promotional. But they were up for it; they were game. And uh, and then I come home and I read about uh, Angus, and I just thought, wow, this is just such an odd story. You know, and and I have no real judgment. I mean, listen, if if he is a person of faith, and he feels that he can no longer, you know, in his heart be a part of the show, there's ways to deal with that, I guess. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that that the faith is wrong or whatever, because I don't know. I don't know exactly what he believes. All I know is that it's really odd behavior for someone who was on one of the most popular television shows uh, on you know, television who's making an enormous amount of money from it to say that, you know, the show is from Satan and that he wants off in such a public way. Right, yeah. 
No, I, I definitely agree. There's something kind of unusual. Uh, there's more to the story, and the truth is we'll never know what that story is. It's a developing story. A developing story, and we'll never know, probably, no matter what uh, is said, what TMZ or anybody reports on, we'll probably never really know no. uh, what the truth is going on with there. Um, well, uh, this is the time of year in which um, there's a lot of discussion over what is um, – the, the very best, you know, whether it be the best movies of the year, the best books, uh, the best technology. It's been kind of a sad year in terms of consumer technology. There hasn't been a lot of innovation. But what has been happening is there's been a lot of great stuff happening in science. Mm. Um, and so I, I tend to kind of pay more attention there because you got crazy stuff. you got sky cranes that are happening, and Walt Disney is now building robots. It's a crazy, crazy world. But I wanted to talk about uh, a development that just happened recently in terms of research with cows, and uh, specifically in terms of developing synthetic beef. Oops, I see now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so here's the, the issue. Um, what the, the problem in terms of trying to solve with synthetic beef is this, is that we've, there was a time that as you traveled around the world, you would have different countries where they would predominantly eat different food. You'd right. have uh, a lot of seafood in Japan. China was very heavy when it came to pork. Uh, Peru, believe it or not, eats a lot of guinea pigs. That's uh, yes, as in what we keep as pets, they eat like millions and millions of guinea pigs every year. It's a, you know it's what? A, I'm sure they're probably delicious. I will never know though <laughs> firsthand, but I'm sure they might be tasty. <laughs> but I, I mean, the the thing is that every culture had its own kind of different uh, food culture that was built up. Some, you know, there are places that even eat insects. That has started to change as you start to get the um, the dominance of fast food changes, chains and uh, the, 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 the efficiency of food processing. We're starting to see that the entire planet is now starting to eat lots and lots of beef, right? Uh, including countries like China, including India. In fact, at this point in time, uh, it's estimated there are 1.4 billion cows on the planet, which is a, a crazy number of cows. In fact, if you were to take all the cows and calculate what they're combined weight would be, and then calculate all the combined weight of all the wild animals around the world, right. cows outweigh all the wild animals on the planet 10 to 1. What? 10 to 1. We have become... I mean, by wild animals, are, are you bringing down the average by including uh, mirror cats that weigh, you know, several ounces? Not average. Like, you know, if you had this imaginary scale, you're throwing the blue whales and the meerkats and all, you know, anything that, that's not uh, part of the, the, the food system, that's not on a, on a farm or anything like that, cows outweigh 10 to 1. It's just absolutely astonishing. Right. So that uh, has caused a real problem in terms of things like not just the amount of methane that the cows are creating, but also the impact that um, all the farmland that's used to do cattle production is having in terms of habitat loss. Uh, and it's just generally a bad idea when you have an entire planet become that dependent on any one particular resource. It's, it's right. good to have a sense of diversity. But uh, just recently, uh, a university in Holland, uh, University of Hash, Magrach, something like that. I can't <laughs> pronounce the word. Um, but they have finally produced their first morsel of synthetic beef. Uh, here, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. It's not terribly impressive. But I thought it was very interesting. When I first saw it, I thought this was the pat of butter that was being put on the frying pan to prepare oh, it. But believe it or not, that oh, is... I have to click that so I can see. That yeah. is synthetic beef? So this is synthetic beef. What they've done is they have taken uh, muscle cells from a living cow and then have cultivated those cells so that they grow just like they would on, on, a, on a living cow, but instead within a, a culture lab in a Petri dish. And they've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, in fact, they say it's, it's taken about 15 years just to get to this point. Right. They have a little tiny yellow beef patty that they can actually fry up. Um, you know, they say uh, you eat with your eyes. <laughs> no. That was not appealing to me. That was not visually appealing. I wonder no, what Gordon Ramsay would do to that to make it visually appealing because that was not visually appealing. It, it was very yellow. Beef yeah. tends to be kind of red and then uh, cooks towards a golden brown. Yeah. Uh, the funny part is that because no one had ever tasted it. I mean, you have people who have been working on this substance for a very long time, years and years and years, and no one had gotten to the point of actually trying to cook or eat any of this stuff. This was the first time that they had something that was actually uh, potentially edible. And they fried it up, gave it a bit of a taste, and you know what? The, 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 the ruling was it tasted like fried chicken. 
There's... Oh, wow. <laughs> Fried oh. chicken. So they're still a little bit away from actually getting towards something that actually looks and tastes like beef. It didn't have any sm a discernible smell. It was uh, as they were cooking it. I mean, well, I, I get it then. I get it as a, as a, um, a, a scientific achievement. Yeah. You have created something with the molecular structure of beef. Here it is. But it, 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 but it, so much of, of, I mean, and maybe just as a pure food source, I mean, we have to feed people somehow, and there's lots of people that don't have food. Maybe, you know, I don't know maybe it's survival. I don't know. I don't know the ethics and all that stuff. Oh, that's for another day. But just the appearance of it is so unappealing. And if it's supposed, why are they calling it synthetic beef? If it tastes like chicken, everything tastes like chicken. Snake apparently tastes like chicken. I'm sure guinea pig tastes like chicken. But this this isn't synthetic beef. It's synthetic goop that kind of tastes like something. It's bovine inspired maybe, but it tastes like something else. I don't understand this at all. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, my little wheel and relax. And, and they're they're to to try to be fair to them. This is uh, a proof of concept. So this is not a finished product or not a, a finished result yet. But um, what I found that was interesting, because yes, you're absolutely right. In the initial knee jerk reaction from a lot of people is going to be, do I want to eat something that was grown in a lab as yeah. opposed to something that came from a farm? Uh, yeah. Do I want to you know uh, eat something that doesn't look or even necessarily taste like the beef that I'm, I'm, you know, is that going to make any much of a change? To most people, I think that if it looks and tastes like beef and it's a lot cheaper than what they're used to, it's probably going to become very successful. There's a lot of people who eat that kind of stuff. but Yeah, I suppose there are. I mean, but there's there are just as many people. I mean, look how the organic movement has has changed the way people eat. I mean, and, you know, uh, there's locavore, the locavore movement where people only will eat something that's grown within 100 kilometers of their home. Now, these are first world issues, like the, those, the, the locavore thing and that. I mean, you know, these are, these are choices that people make that, you know, not everyone has the luxury of making those choices, and I understand that. But I, I do think that people um, are now, I think, just much more aware of what they're eating in a way that, they, that, that people didn't used to be. I mean, I think that people used to um, kind of accept that if it was for sale, then it was okay. And now people question, I think, a little bit more the, the products that they're buying. And they, they question, you know, how things are made and where they're sourced and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure that just because it's a lot cheaper, I think, you know, if if, if people saw just the yellow goop, that here you go, it's cheap. And it tastes yeah. kind of like chicken. Well, I don't I mean, think people are going to line up for this. Obviously, I mean, they can take that yellow goop and they can put it into another product or dress it up, or you know, yeah. it's it's a different story when it's sort of part of a hot dog wiener, for example. Or yeah, something. the kind of thing that 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 holds beef together, that pink slime stuff that they use apparently to to make processed foods. Yeah. But uh, there's a side to this that I found really fascinating because I, I sort of knew, okay, well, that's the basic issue: is anyone going to want to eat this if it's not terribly appealing? I think over time you can make anything appealing. But what's interesting about it is that um, they say that if this becomes successful and they get it to the point where yes they can mass produce uh, and this it, it, it sort of give it the texture and the taste and the quality of proper beef, what will happen is here's the thing, they can they can produce this meat just from a biopsy of a single cow. So you've got a, a healthy living cow, you perform a biopsy on it in order to get the muscle uh, cells, and then you cultivate that, grow that in the lab. They can produce um, 20,000 tons of this kind of meat, and the cow continues to live. The cow can still be out in a pasture living its life, eating grass. Meanwhile, they've managed to get 20,000 tons from this cow that can feed a great deal more people. Uh, and without the methane production, and without necessarily taking right. away from habitat loss. That's but, interesting to me. No, that's that. That listen, that's fascinating. And and you know, I mean, talk about you know ending world hunger in a in a you know in a, in, a, in a fairly uh, fast way. Except that you know a lot of the world doesn't eat beef and it doesn't eat uh, <laughs> stuff. So maybe that's an issue. But I'm sure they can do this with other people. But twenty thousand tons—that's a lot. From and I don't know that I want any food that you know. Look, we're having these. Do you know that this came from a biopsy? You know, I don't think, I don't know. I, you're not selling this very well. There will never be a Food Network show about this. Well, <laughs> I mean, and, and obviously. It will never appear on uh, Top Chef. 
Well, no. I mean, it, you know, clearly once the marketing staff get in and they kind of dress it up, a lot of the food that we, we do have that's available in supermarkets. It is biopsy barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you really don't want to know how Chicken McNuggets are made. You don't want to know, you know, yeah, in terms of... how the sausage is made, yeah. Right, yeah, that kind of thing. And, and all that becomes sort of lost at the end of it. But what was intriguing is I'm not a vegetarian. I, I So for me, it's hard to kind of wrap my head around what kind of issues this may present. But when this story broke, and that image was kind of floating around. The initial response from a lot of vegetarians was that this changes everything for them. That well, while they would not have a hamburger, they would happily eat something like this that, that allowed animals to continue to live. Yeah, because a lot of people uh, don't eat meat. I'm, I, don't, I eat meat. I don't eat a lot of meat, though. It's a, the, the, the odd thing is I, I'm, I'm, I have no reason other than I just feel better when I don't, and so I don't eat a lot of it. But I do. I do eat meat when, when you know, uh, from time to time. And, uh, but for no ethical reason. And I think if I was an ethical vegetarian, that maybe this would change things for me because it's not harming animals. And, I mean, assuming that the biopsy is not, you know, no. invasive and terribly painful and whatever else. But, but I don't know. I don't know. I just I, I can't really. I, this is not a food that I will be lining up at the food truck. To, to try. All right, so here's where my brain went to uh, after I was thinking about all this kind of stuff. Because, I, you know, I began to think, well, okay, so there's no real reason why this has to be done just to a cow. That there's no reason why they couldn't take muscle cells from any animal yeah. that's out there. And so you could potentially produce a line of, uh, of hamburger patties or nuggets that could be from any animal on the planet. So you could create uh, Komodo dragon steaks or panda burgers or anything along those lines. And, and that, to me, I think is kind of interesting because I do feel that uh, we tend to lack a bit of diversity when it comes to our food sources, especially meat when you go into a restaurant. It's usually you know, three or four things. Oh, you either have the beef, the chicken, the seafood, or the fish. Yeah. You know, and it's crazy or, exotic. There's some lamb for you, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and I, I kind of, I mean, I've been reading a lot of books and and uh, watching a lot of programs that have been about people who have been very adventurous in terms of what they eat. Uh, people who've gone on, like Charles Darwin, who ate an owl or uh, stuff like that. And there are times in which I wish that I could be that adventurous, but I do run up the issue against the issues of that I'm someone I don't necessarily want to go around extinguishing the lives of, of wild animals just to be able to fulfill that sense I of... I hate live monkey brains. Look at me. Yeah, I know. I get that. I, I wonder. I mean, you know, there was a time, and within my lifetime, not long ago, uh, that people knew where your food came from. Mm -hmm. Often, unless you lived in New York, the middle of New York City, and I think that possibly even then, you knew a farmer. Somebody that you're connected to new from and now that's that's gone i mean mm -hmm. when we drive outside the city not very far from here um and pass all the new subdivisions and all the new little cookie cutter townhouses that all look the same well all those used to be farms where people who live where i live now downtown used to buy their food and so i mean the way we do consume things is much different so I don't know. Maybe it is the next wave. I'm having a rough time wrapping my head around it. Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of crazy it technology. If you hadn't shown me that picture or mentioned the word biopsy to me, <laughs> I, I might be having a better reaction to that. <laughs> biopsy is just a clinical term. It's nothing, you know. I don't want anything about clinical about the food that I eat. <laughs> I don't want there to be a clinical term that does that that right. that predicates the the you know origin of the food. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, they're also doing something else with uh, cows in Australia, which is really crazy. Very, very crazy. You'll, you'll have a hard time wrapping your head around it. Uh, again, 1.4 billion cows on the planet. That causes a real problem when it comes to methane and greenhouse gases. So there's a lot of crazy research going into this. In Australia, they've been spending a lot of time doing research because of kangaroos. Kangaroos, which are bizarre animals, once you start to kind of get into their anatomy. Kangaroos... Kangaroos do not burp, nor do they fart. What? Yeah, they, they simply do. Do they eventually just explode? Is that how they die? Yeah. Well, as it turns out, because this was something that, you know, of course, became very curious for a lot of scientists. As it turns out, kangaroos have a colony of bacteria in their intestines and their stomach that consumes all the methane. Oh. So they actually, as creatures, aren't producing 
uh, the, the, the very harmful methane. And there are people in Australia who do eat kangaroos. You can go and you can get kangaroos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you can get kangaroo. I mean, you know, there are, you, you said earlier, you know, so many restaurants now, it's like, would you like to chicken, lamb, or beef, or whatever? You know, have a fairly limit. But there are places here, uh, certainly in Toronto, I know, where you can get the emu steaks and, uh, and kangaroo and stuff like that. You can eat all these kind of exotic uh, creatures. Sure, yeah. Uh, so the idea oh, was... The kangaroos are filled with fart bugs, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> so they've been trying for years to see if they can get the bacteria uh, from the kangaroos and introduce it to the cows, and I guess that has kind of failed. So they've gone to Plan B. Plan B is really insane. They now have a farm of cows in Australia, and they have fed each cow a submersible sensor. This is uh, a little tiny submarine, right? The cow ingests it. It goes down their throat into the cow's stomach where the submarine pops out a set of wings. This is so that the submarine can navigate through the stomach and prevent itself from you know, being going out the, the back end of the cow. It can stay there. Once it's in the cow's stomach, it then uses infrared beams, those little red beams that we have like on a TV remote control, but it uses those to monitor the gas content inside the stomach. And it then transmits that information wirelessly back to the farm central computer. And, and the whole point of this is to measure which cows are producing more methane than other cows. And but which then, breed, you mean? Yeah. So, you know, from the point of that, when you breed the next generation of cows, you only choose the cows who naturally are producing a lower rate of methane in their digestive system than others. And so, yeah, it's crazy. There are now cows. If it goes well, then you could end up seeing cows... Uh, elsewhere in the country, you could drive along a highway in Ontario and say, look, and wave at the cows, and they would have little submarines swimming about in their stomachs. That's crazy. That's, that's just, crazy. Yeah, it's well, crazy. I, I didn't know that about kangaroos. That's really interesting that they have these little uh, fart eaters uh, within uh, them. <laughs> here's <laughs> the thing. Uh, and I don't want to get too disgusting when it comes to kangaroos. In fact, there's a lot about kangaroos that just will knock your head right off your shoulders. But uh, if you were to lift up uh, the tail of a kangaroo to try to you know, figure out if it's a boy kangaroo or a girl kangaroo, there's only one hole. So every other animal on the planet, you know, there's, there's an anus and then there's a front half. Kangaroos only have one. Everything goes through that one hole. So they... <laughs> <laughs> just one, and it just gets weird. Yeah, it's very, very strange. But you know, or a better way to put it is that they're magical creatures, very they unique like in terms of their parts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's so funny because you know uh, so much about Australia is so strange. You know, and a friend of mine moved to Australia years ago, and he was so excited about seeing a kangaroo, and it was like he was he just like they, they, they hop around. It was wild. He had this really sort of romantic notion of seeing these really exotic creatures. And uh, someone picks him up at the airport, and they're driving him to town, and the first kangaroo he sees is roadkill, a big real splatted kangaroo on the road. Because, they, you know, they can jump 20 feet or something, you know, some incredible amount, I don't know if it's 20 feet. They can jump really far, and they tend to jump out in front of cars. And so a lot of cars have these uh, high-pitched, you know, like dog whistles uh, that, you know, that, that are a deterrent to them. Humans can't hear it, but the kangaroos are like, ooh, cars are coming. But uh, I shouldn't jump in front of those cars. I might get hurt. But uh, yeah, it, it was it was disillusioning for him to uh, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. wished kangaroo be his first vision of the country. Mm -hmm. No, so very strange story. Uh, I'm glad that you took something away from that. Hopefully, you won't have any dreams about little pats of butter in oh, a yellow, bag. yellow, beefy. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and I'm not particularly squeamish about things that I eat, but. You know, I just hear you hear so much about Franken foods, and there it is again. Thank you. Yeah. Very much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, you, but you hear so much about Franken foods and, and things like that, and I just wonder, you know, what form that would take. I wonder what will happen if, if we eat it for 20 years. You know, will will you know eventually? You know, we just turn into big piles of yellow goo. You know. Well, I'll, I'll leave you one with one thought. You know, when it comes to Franken food, um, carrots are an example of Franken food. Yep. There is no such thing as a natural orange carrot. That's right. Well, they, they were, they were uh, standardized, right? Because, you know, in the, from what I understand, uh, when they started selling, you know, Bugs Bunny, you started eating them, and they started to become popular. Uh, and, you know, the big chains wanted to carry them. And they're like, well, people, uh, it's like McDonald's. No matter where you go in the world, you know what you're going to get at a McDonald's. And that's what they thought should happen with, Carrots as well, right? Well, carrots originally were purple or white. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, that that's how they were, and there was a town. I again, I think it's Holland. Wow, you know, uh, some places have such a long tradition of this, but I think there was a town in Holland, and their um, official color was orange. And so they worked hard. They managed to interbreed different species of carrots until they can get uh, a breed that was orange. And it's just, you know, naturally it's just consumer choice. If you're in a marketplace and you have a choice between a purple carrot or an orange, you're going to go for an orange. And, and now that dominates the world. Every, it's hard to think of a carrot that isn't orange. But that well, is an example of, of something that has been made by humans. It's not something that occurs naturally. So it's, it's sort of been part of our food system for a lot longer than people uh, realize. Yeah, no, I know. I, I think it's funny because uh, uh, now my feeling is that the purple carrots, because you can buy them now again in Loblaws, places like that, they've become popular again because they're unusual and they're weird and they're, they're you know, heirloom, they're, they call heirloom now. Like those weird misshapen tomatoes that you buy now, <laughs> yeah. that's what tomatoes used to look like. But now when you buy them, because they're weird and misshapen and whatever else, they cost $27 for a tomato, you know, so you're actually uh, paying a great deal more now for what was the original state, because someone had to, uh, you know, specially grow these things, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I, I, because I am so poorly prepared today, uh, I, have nothing, you know, uh, I have nothing else. I, you know, I, I, I'm thrilled to see that the Rolling Stones are playing again. They have a new single out. We talked about that last week. The new video with Numi Rapace. Uh, I think it's pretty cool, and it's interesting because I posted that on Facebook, and, around, and people were kind of cynical about it. They're like, oh, they've been around for 50 years. What new things do they have to say? We're so bored by this. So I'm like, you know, uh, what we're seeing here is, in a lot of ways, history in the making. There's been no band except yeah. maybe the Beach Boys that have lasted this long and had uh, maintained this kind of significance. Uh, the Rolling Stones, a night or so ago, sold out 20,000 seats, the first of a few nights they're playing in London, at 210 pounds a ticket, uh, and they played two and a half hours. Apparently the show was mind-blowing, and uh, they had Bill Wyman, who's the original bass player who hasn't played with them since 1989 or 1990, uh, play, and then Mick Jones, who was their guitar player in the 70s, also stand in. So it would have been a cool show to see, and the reports about it said that uh, on the way out, they were, you know, reporters were saying, you know, you paid uh, what would be, uh, what, 400 bucks Canadian or something to, to see the yeah. show. Uh, that seems like a lot of money. And everyone was like, totally worth it, though. They didn't get one person that said that they felt ripped off by the amount of money they had to pay. Because you're seeing, you know, the world's greatest rock and roll band at age 70. You know, Keith is 69 or something like that. Charlie is, I think, in his 70 as a drummer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of amazing that they're still, you know, up and running and, and plugging away. And last night, Judd Apatow, completely off topic. We were just, we were, eventually the interview just turned into us talking, you know, about things. So it became less an interview, just more like a, hey, you know what I like? I like the Rolling Stones. And, you know, it went from there. And he told a story about how years ago, uh, he and Ben Stiller, this is before Ben Stiller was really famous, uh, got a, a, a job offer from the Rolling Stones to write a comedy that the Rolling Stones would wow. appear on. I know, it's crazy, right? So uh, they come up with this idea that uh, for a movie that was going to star Brad Pitt, and Brad Pitt was going to be like this huge Stones fan, and I can't remember, it might have been Ben Stiller would be the other one, there were two of them, that were going to like follow the Rolling Stones from city to city, like deadheads, you know, and go to all the concerts, and then they would build in comedy sequences in and around these musical sequences. And so they, they go to L.A., they work out the details, and then they get summoned to Toronto where the Rolling Stones are rehearsing for one of those big mega tours. As it would, they, every time they tour, they come here for a month or so and, and rehearse beforehand. And Judd Apatow said, apparently, to Ben Stiller before he went in, he said, okay, Ben, you do all the talking. You pitch the bare bones here. I'll be the funny guy, man. I'll just I'll come in and I'll zing them. I'll zing them. When, when I need to. And, said, and then I walk in and there's Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Charlie Watts, and he says, I was so paralyzed with fear, I couldn't say a word, so I completely stranded Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller just like, hey, trying to sing and dance and do the whole thing, and, uh, and Apatow just sat there silent. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, but, you know, the, the meeting went well, and the Stone seemed to like the idea. And then Mick said, well, you know what, we have to go back and rehearse 
would you like to come watch us rehearse? Wow. And after three hours, we sat there and watched them rehearse. And he said it was amazing. They'd listen to the song from the record. Then they'd say, hey, let's see, we remember how this one goes. And then they'd work out. He said it was just a mind-blowing experience. But he said the most mind-blowing thing was midway through the rehearsal, Mick sort of shuts everything down. It's just Ben Stiller and, and Judd Apatow in the audience. <laughs> and, and he shuts everything down and comes down and he goes, you guys doing okay? Uh, can I get you some water or something? And he goes, Mick Jagger <laughs> is, is offering me a drink. He was offering to go get me some water. Mind blowing. <laughs> and apparently while he was writing on this at his home in L.A., uh, he got constant messages from Jagger. Just about whatever. Ideas, pitches, how things going, you know. And he said uh, that it was, he saved them all, of course, you, as yeah. you would, getting messages from Mick Jagger. But he said what he did was he, he put them in his computer so that if he was typing and he made a mistake, instead of getting a little boo sound, he'd get uh, Mick Jagger going, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> and he would get little phrases from Mick Jagger, and these would be cues that when he gets an email, it's like, uh, Hey, it's Mick here. You know, that kind of wow. thing. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, oh, oh. As a Rolling Stones fan, uh, the cockles of my heart were warmed by that story. Oh, and I completely cool. understand. I totally understand the 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 uh, being kind of starstruck. It doesn't really happen to me now. In fact, it doesn't happen to me at all now. But once, when I met Paul McCartney, I was completely gobsmacked by meeting Paul McCartney. And I knew all day that I was going to meet him. And it was in a party situation. It wasn't, I wasn't working. It wasn't an interview. Yeah. And uh, I knew I was going to meet him, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have something clever to say. I'm going to come up with something witty and clever to say. And, of course, as soon as I meet him and I shake his hand, then his life flashed before my eyes, and my mind just went blank. And I was like, damn it. You know? And then I was like, all, all you can think of to say is, well, I've always been a big Beatles fan. And, of course, yeah. he's, like, he's never heard that before. Yeah. And so <laughs> it was... It wasn't, uh, we didn't become friends. We didn't come, oh. become friends after that meeting, and I really hope we would. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> sure, you know, he probably would have very nice things to say about you. <laughs> it's like that, that Beatles fan guy. He was awesome. Yeah. I like that guy. <laughs> um, well, there's a, a new show that's going to be coming out, uh, very interesting, called, let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, I was just announced. This is called Robot Combat League. Ooh, I okay? like that. And it's going to be coming out in February on the Sci-Fi Channel. That's a channel in the states that spells Sci-Fi with Y's. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they are the people behind uh, Sharktopus and yeah. uh, all those movies. Yeah. Well, and thankfully, this looks like it's going to be a much higher budget. Uh, yeah. But this is the concept behind the movie Real Steel that we saw last year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're trying to actually make it real. So you're going to have uh, several teams of eight-foot-tall robots, and each robot is controlled through shadow boxing with a real athlete. That's crazy. It's pretty nuts. Uh, and they've lined up a pile of people. That's, uh, if you're a wrestling fan, I'm not. Uh, from WWE, that's Jericho. Right. Does that red one have an axe for a head? That's correct. The red <laughs> one has an axe for a head. That's awesome. This is going to be pretty cool. Uh, and, well, I mean, uh, they've also got uh, George Lucas's daughter. She's an MMA fighter. Yeah, She's yeah, yeah. The, um, pretty good one, too, apparently. Yeah. Uh, they've got a race car driver. They've gone for some, I think, some football coaches. Each right. one is going to be hooked up to a harness that will allow them to map their moves uh, to the eight-foot-tall uh, robot that, that you see. That's interesting. So, I mean, yeah, I wonder how responsive it would be, you know, because boxing is split second. Yes. You know, I just wonder how. That's really interesting, though. And the axe for the head. That guy can't lose. How can you lose when you have an axe for a head? An axe <laughs> yeah. for a face, really, is what he has. I'll pull up uh, another image. There we are. So this is one uh, that they showed of, of two robots fighting. So you've got sparks flying. You've got uh, a lot of lighting, uh, an arena in which they're going to be battling next to each other, back and forth. Now, I mean, from a robotics point of view, it's not quite like the robots that you saw in Real Steel, which would have been worth right. millions of dollars to be able to yeah. assemble. Uh, what you're talking about here is more along the lines of animatronics, the kind right. of stuff that's used for theme parks. In fact, the guy who's designing this is a man who's done uh, animatronics for Hellboy uh, movies generally and, and that kind of thing. But, well, I mean... There, in, in, you know, and, and the idea, though, is it's still human-based. I mean, you're still the, 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 the only twist 
from MMA or whatever, boxing, is that it's robots doing it, but it's still humans actually doing it. So you're not, there's no artificial intelligence involved here. You're not training a robot how to fight, which that would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah, I would love that. Um, no, it, it's rogue. then they go rogue and go crazy. They try and take over things. I mean, that's not yeah. good. So I mean, it's still a human-controlled experience. Uh, I don't, you know, my only thing is that it's different from the robot war programs that have been on before, which right. I thought were always really kind of captivating. Uh, the, the original robot wars that you had, say, in the 1990s, was actual people who had to design and build and invest their own money to create these little. I mean, they were small. They were remote-controlled robots. But it was interesting because it was like problem solving on television in real time. Right. And that you would have people, all you would have is the parameters. You knew how big the arena was going to be. You knew how heavy your device was going to be. You knew what kind of restrictions were. But then you can be free with your ideas. And each season, as you would watch, it would be really fascinating to see some 14-year-old or some guys that come in and have figured out something that no one else has figured out, where they've got a robot that can flip other robots or yeah, yeah, can yeah, go yeah. at high speed and all that kind of thing. And so I feel that this series is kind of going to miss a little bit of that, that you're going away from, they're calling it a reality TV series, but I feel like the original Robot Wars was true reality TV. Here you've got... Uh, athletic celebrities that are being time, uh, teamed up with really high-priced sort of puppets to try yeah, to kind of do that, choreography. See, that's what it is. It's the yeah. high-priced puppet thing. And it's cool. Like, it'll be cool. Uh, it'll be cool for one episode. It'll be interesting for two, maybe. But it only, you know, and it will only be cool if, like, the guy with the axe for the head splits another one in half or whether they, they, when they, when they go down, they explode or something like that. There's got to be a huge payoff for this. Because really, you're not seeing robots fighting. You're seeing people fighting via robots. So it is just a big puppet show. Yeah, it's it's going to be another. You know, hopefully it'll be better than American Gladiators, but maybe a little more uh, realistic than say WWE wrestling. You know, that kind of thing. What's interesting though is that as often happens in Hollywood uh, in the industry, of course, they're not the only ones developing this kind of a show. Yeah. Discovery Channel is also developing a very similar program called Robageddon. Uh, <laughs> and what's going to be interesting about this is that the two people involved is Mark Burnett, wow. you know, from Survivor, and James Survivor. Cameron. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, the, so it'll be the highest tech. It, it'll have it'll have Mark Burnett's genius for the format. Yes. For creating this kind of crazy reality show, sort of you know, edge of your seat kind of format. And then cameras' love of technology should be married in there. So you'll have something cooler, I would think. I hope so, that. yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I think a show like this really needs, is you need someone that can fight uh, network executives that want to get in there and understand only the aspects they understand, which is the human drama and the manipulation. You want somebody that's going to say, no, 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 no. This has to be something that is going to test the technology that's being yeah. used. We want robots that are going to, you know, Introduce situations that you wouldn't find in normal right. boxing or normal wrestling. Right. right. But I have to admit, I'm I'm I'll be watching. <laughs> well, I, I will watch. Uh, to I, I would watch one episode and engage from there. I would watch one episode, and if there is a spectacular robot explosion or something, then maybe I don't know. But. They, they've been hinting that there will be heads knocked off. That there will be, you know, it's it's going to be almost... with wires coming out and, this, <laughs> and the robot tears. Why? Why did you do this? And electronic voices. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I want human slash cyber drama. That's what I want. Yeah, and and I, well, I mean, we'll see how it goes. I, I think generally when you take something that's kind of a geek culture. Uh, the mistake is to try to translate it into, say, sports or to translate it into wrestling. Uh, they've been doing that with video games, and it just doesn't work. They keep, they've keep they got this uh, gaming league, and they try to treat all the gamers as if they are cyber athletes, and it just doesn't really take off. But, I mean, Robot Wars was a fantastic period. They still hold those battles in uh, San Francisco. A lot, in fact, that's where Mythbusters came from. Half of those guys used to compete. In these robo battles, and they were amazing. They were fantastic. I mean, it got to the point where what I liked about the original Robot Wars was that you didn't have a group of network executives in a room going, "Okay, 
What what twist can we introduce for the next season? You, you didn't have to do that. The guys who designed the robots would suddenly start ripping apart robots, and you see parts going to the ceiling, and they go, oh, okay, well, now we have to redesign the arena, because otherwise somebody's going to get hurt just watching this thing. Right, That's right. the element that I love, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I uh, Well, I, I will tune in. I will tune in once for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, there we go. We've wrapped up another episode of Hail You Zombies, and we're very thankful that you've joined us. We'll be back again next week with a whole set of new topics, uh, maybe new things that are from Richard's desk. And uh, <laughs> we <laughs> encourage you to go to our website. Right Here's a blue meanie. If you're a, if you're a, a Beatles fan, oh. this is a blue meanie from, uh, from Yellow Submarine. There's lots of things here. There's lots of things to occupy my mind, make my eyeballs dance. And as always, you can find us at our website at hailyouzombies.com if you have a suggestion in terms of uh, what you would like to to see us talk about, or you know, maybe you want to weigh in and tell me, are you a vegetarian? Would you eat synthetic beef? Uh, is there a, an endangered animal that you've been aching to have a steak or a burger from? We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, people.